Hello, everyone. My name is Chad, and I'm a criminologist. I'm uh, actually a criminologist that specializes in computer crimes, so cybercrime, cyber ethics, uh, that kind of thing. And this summer, I was teaching a game hacking course, and we ran through a game called Pwn Adventure 3, which was a lot of fun. And so I decided I was also going to run through another game along those lines called Squally. And while I was searching for other games that I could run through after that, I came across two games, Welcome to the Game and Welcome to the Game 2 by Reflect Studios. After a little bit of research, it seems like those aren't uh, the kinds of games that I'm looking for in terms of game hacking, but I did think that they were really interesting. Their premise was interesting, and, and the story from what I saw uh, was pretty interesting as well. From what I understand, um, it has something to do with... Um, collecting codes on the dark web, but well, a simulated version of the dark web anyway. And so I decided rather than running through those games and doing a let's play, since they're not really hacking games, um, it might still be interesting to go over them from a perspective of a computer criminologist and point out some of the themes in the game and their real world analogs. So rather than playing through it myself, I've actually found a video here which was posted by Ronin Hero Games, which is a full playthrough of the game without any commentary. And what I plan to do is, I guess, a sort of react video. I'm not going to go through the entire hour and 40 minutes, uh, but I think, you know, maybe it would be interesting to spend 20, 30 minutes or so um, at the beginning of the game going over some of the things uh, that, that we see. At least, I hope that's the case. I hope that you'll find it interesting, and I hope that I actually have some things to say, so... I'm going to go ahead and start the video, and uh, when we get to some some part that's interesting, I'll chime in. So this was by Reflect Studios. I did see a twit longer uh, about the developer Adam of Reflect Studios, who uh, was for uh, the developer for Welcome to the Game 1 and 2. Um, and uh, I'd rather, it's probably better if I don't editorialize on that, but suffice to say, it contributed to my decision not to purchase the game. You can see that we have some individuals here with masks. Uh, they're not the traditional Guy Fox masks that we see that's associated with uh, with hacking culture and anonymous. So I'm assuming that they're not supposed to be an analog to those. So here on the loading screen, actually, I have something to contribute right away. Um, you are Clint Edwards in this game, an investigative reporter for one of the leading online news sites. It doesn't say which one. Um, there's any number of news sources, sources online. All, all news has moved essentially to digital formats. Uh, the premise of the game is you are investigating mysterious disappearances and murderers related to the deep web. And you're deep in your case and about to make a breakthrough, but then you receive a call from someone least expected. So, uh, what I want to chime in here is, well, there's a couple of things actually. This, this short little blurb actually reveals uh, quite a bit um, of interesting information in my opinion. So first of all, it doesn't say what news site you work for. Um, there are a myriad of online news sources, um, and uh, this doesn't relate directly to cybercrime or criminology, but from a cyber sociology perspective, it's very interesting. Many people today scarcely remember a time uh, in the world pre-internet. The internet has been around for a very long time now. It's been available uh, generally speaking, to the public, along with personal computers since the mid-90s or so. So that's quite a long time. I'm recording this in 2021. So it's it's been it's been some time since then. Now, if you don't recall a time prior to the internet, you may not be aware of the fact that um, prior to that, if you had a message that you felt was worth telling the world, you had to convince the right people that it was worth saying. These individuals were people with what is known as publishing authority, right? So we're talking about producers, we're talking about editors. Well, that's no longer the case. That was one of the major societal revolutions of the proliferation of the internet, of the dawn of the information age, is the decentralization of that publishing authority. So literally anybody who had any message that they felt was worth broadcasting to the public was suddenly able to do so, broadcast a message to the entire world simultaneously. Now, the, that contribution to society cannot be uh, overstated. Um, that does there is of course a double-edged sword, right? For every good there is a bad. So, the decentralization of publishing authority means that 
those few individuals with that publishing authority, the aforementioned authority, um, they could control essentially what people knew, which is a tremendous amount of power for any even small group of individuals to have. On the other hand, those individuals were also responsible for a certain amount of quality in the information that was published as well. They were able to be accountable to that. Now, that's no longer the case, which is why we see so much information that is just not worth knowing or is just plain false these days. Now, there's one other thing I would like to uh, point out related to news here. Uh, the idea that Clint Edwards, an investigative reporter, is going on the deep web uh, for this story is not all that far-fetched. Journalists, of course, will go wherever news is. However, we generally uh, equate the dark web to crime, right? It is a place where cyber criminals go congregate to commit cyber crimes or other crimes. Um, that's not necessarily the case. The dark web is essentially a, could be summarized as simply a series of websites which cannot be accessed without the use of privacy enhancing technologies or certain privacy enhancing technologies. Now, there are perfectly good and legitimate reasons why people would want to take great lengths to stay anonymous over the internet, and journalism is one of them. So in addition to what you might consider to be the typical traffic that might be associated with the dark web, like drug trafficking or whatever, um, journalism, uh, whistleblowers connecting with journalists to pass on information is another big and, I would argue, legitimate reason for there being a dark web. Even, uh, even sending email anonymously through some kind of anonymizing service is not necessarily safe in any respect, but especially not safe over the clearnet. Well, we'll get to the, actually delineating the deep web and clearnet and dark web in a little bit, I feel. Uh, let's let the game go a little bit and see, see what comes up. So we seem to have a notepad here that presumably was written by the protagonist of the game. Again, this game was uh, released in 2016, so 2016 call log through seized data. Multiple calls from an unknown caller. Cellular network, heavy breathing only. Always call at 10 p.m. through VoIP. The night of the incidents, who is Adam? Um, to be honest with you, reading this, I'm a little bit concerned that this game may not be what I expected it to be. Um, we clearly have some techno babble here. Um, so I guess just for example, um, multiple calls from an unknown caller. Okay, that's fine. Um, unknown caller, when we say those terms in the real world, we are generally referring to a call that does not have a user displayed through caller ID. A caller ID is not a security feature by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, the number that appears in caller ID is entirely controllable by the person placing that call. Um, so it's not a security measure. So when it says unknown caller, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about some uh, nefarious cyber criminal that's hacking a phone system or something like that. It simply means that either they don't have a number that's identifiable through the caller ID system, or uh, they opted to not include that information when they placed the call. Uh, second, the uh, second note there that it's cellular network, I'm not sure if that is supposed to imply that it's, again, some something potentially nefarious going on or, or something like that, uh, or that the individual is taking steps to obfuscate their identity by using a cellular network, but that clearly could not be the case um, unless this world does not run parallel to ours in terms of technological advancement. Uh, noting cellular network there just simply means they're using a cell phone. There are different kinds of cellular technology, and here uh, in the United States, where I'm recording this, um, we have many different providers that utilize a, an infrastructure of uh, a cellular and networking infrastructure. So these two things, the unknown caller and them being in on a cellular network are meaningless, right? It just means they were using a cell phone to place a call and caller ID doesn't, I mean, even in 2021, doesn't always work very well uh, over cellular networks. The heavy breathing part, while that is a little bit more disconcerting, that is a pretty classic sort of crank call kind of behavior, uh, what used to be called or would, would previously be known as an obscene phone call, perhaps, but um, it really, this note is meaningless. That's, this is information no one would ever need to write down, right? Uh, it just means somebody called from a cell phone, really. 
Um, always call at 10 p.m. through VoIP the night of incidents. So VoIP, V-O-I-P, is voice over IP, or IP is short for Internet Protocol. Um, so it's it's an acronym within an acronym here. Um, but uh, again, this doesn't really mean anything. Uh, VoIP would be uh, distinguished from analog phone systems, and uh, there are very few analog phone systems that are still in existence. Now, this was in 2016, but even then, there were very few analog phone systems that were still available. Analog phone systems uh, would be what you may consider to be normal um, uh, telephone lines if you, you know, are... I guess of a certain generation, uh, but they haven't been around for quite a long time. Analog phone systems would be the telecommunications infrastructure that existed prior to the internet uh, that did exist alongside uh, until the proliferation of broadband internet access, which is still not universal even in the United States. But once municipalities had broadband internet access, there was really no need for, for analog phone infrastructure anymore. A few analog phone systems still exist intentionally as a sort of backup security measure uh, in the event that there's some sort of infrastructure destabilization. Um, there are some analog systems that still run to critical infrastructure networks, uh, like for example, the US military and certain energy providers and that kind of a thing may still have some analog phone systems that are up and maintained. Uh, all of the other existing analog phone systems are simply those that still exist because they haven't been updated, although, as I said, there are very, very few of those. So always call at 10 p.m. through VoIP means nothing. It just means they're making a phone call in 2016 or 2021. Um, it's possible that the developers with this note, or I guess I shouldn't say the developers, are protagonists, in this case, since the developers wrote this note from the protagonist perspective, presumably, um, that what the... Uh, the um, protagonist uh, is going for here is that the call needs to be made through a particular telecommunication software, possibly some kind of anonymizing software. Um, if that's the case, then it may be the developer's intention with this note, between the two notes that we see here written down, to signal to us as the player that their protagonist is not particularly tech savvy, because this is meaningless techno babble. This is, these are terms that don't make sense to write down. Um, uh, it would be sort of be like uh, being a chef and um, coming up with an idea for a menu and when writing down dishes, you know, saying something like, um, you know, pan, f you know, pan fry shrimp with a pan and oil. Like these are things that you just say pan fry shrimp and you would know you're supposed to use a pan and oil. There would be no need for that level of specificity, right? All right, enough about these notes, let's continue on. So it seems our protagonist is receiving a phone call here from Adam. Now, Adam, I know, is the name of the developer at Reflect Studios. I, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be some kind of self-insert or something, uh, but uh, I guess now that we have a clear look at the uh, protagonist desktop, I'm not sure what operating system this is supposed to be. It looks to be some kind of, some kind of Linux uh, variant. Not sure which one it's supposed to be. Um, we have a browser, what appears to be a browser window here that says ANN, Anonymous Node Network. Uh, my guess is that this would be the in-game analog to the Tor network or the Onion router. We also have a couple of icons on the desktop behind the call from Adam for Shadow Market and Zero Day Market, which I'm sure we'll take a look at later. So I'm guessing that ANN is the uh, analog to the anonymous node network because that is essentially the technology that's behind onion routing. Essentially, um, uh, internet requests or traffic is obfuscated by a series of intermediary nodes. So the requests pass through a series of nodes on their way to their destination and then are similarly obfuscated on the route back to the requesting client. And of course, encryption is all part of this as well. Uh, but yes, these nodes are sort of um, distinctive of that kind of technology, and um, that's the kind of anonymizing technology that is required to reach Onion sites, which are synonymous with the dark web. Um, so we have a call and coming here from Adam. Let's see what he has to say. It looks like he's got some kind of a website he's pointing us to. It says that this uh, site is live and trending on back channels. He's been monitoring it for a few hours, and every so often a different girl shows up asking for help. They think they are streaming to their face page, but it seems the people holding them are rerouting their stream to this platform. They might be cutting off all cellular data except for their face page, at least that's what I think they're doing. 
They're doing, it seems to be some kind of voting. Okay. Um, so the site that we're at is dead or not preparing next candidate. It says Adam is telling us that this is some kind of voting system. So we have some techno babble here. So clearly that note was not meant to convey to the player that the protagonist is not tech savvy. It's, it's clear that now we have uh, indications that the game itself will simply use um, techno babble or pseudo techno babble um, in, in, in the game. When doing these games, uh, you need to make sure to remain cognizant of the fact uh, that not everything will be identical to the real world. That wouldn't be practical. Not only would that not be a very fun game, but it's also completely unnecessary to re reproduce that level of detail. There's also game theory involved. We have to keep in mind that this is a game and that there is a reality that the developers are creating within the context of the game. And so whatever we see in terms of um, what the information that's presented to us, um, we're not gonna necessarily find a real world direct analog. We may instead uh, have to keep in mind that it's uh, a compromise has been made in the name of the game. Uh, and also that the game world uh, has details that simply only exist within the context of the game world. But we have some techno babble here for sure. Uh, they are. They think they are streaming to their face page, but it seems the people holding them are rerouting their stream to this platform. That doesn't make any sense. Um, I guess a real-world analog in this case might be if you are streaming to YouTube. But you're streaming to YouTube. Uh, what you are streaming to YouTube, rather, is your Twitch stream. So you're streaming on both. But that distinction is also not important, right? That's a distinction without a difference. You're still streaming to both platforms. I'm not sure what they're implying here by saying that they think they're streaming to their face page, but it seems they are actually rerouting them from another streaming platform. Again, distinction without a difference. That is still streaming to both platforms. The next one is also rather suspect. They might be cutting off all cellular data except for their face page. At least that's what I think they're doing, Adams says. Um, so that doesn't mean anything, right? So they're, they're streaming off of a cellular device and they are either blocking all uh, other requests incoming and outgoing via a host-based firewall on that cellular device, or they're doing some kind of DNS black holing for every site except for whatever the domain for face page is. Doesn't make any sense, and there's really no need to say it. Uh, so uh, odd. It's just odd to say it this way, I guess. I don't mean to be critical, uh, you know, of the writing here. Again, I'm just trying to parse this and understand what's going on from, from my perspective. And uh, when I see stuff like this, it only confuses me because it kind of doesn't make any sense. But I digress. We can continue on. So we have a website. It looks like it is a voting system. We have a red skull. We have a green heart. We've got a chat log that's rolling there, dead or not, it says at the top. And looks like a girl who's begging for her life or something like that. So this seems to be alluding to... No, it's buffering. It's in the game, it's buffering. That's not in my YouTube. All right, so it seems like what we're looking at here is the in-game analog of an urban legend called a Red Room. Well, it goes by several names, but we'll say Red Room. The one thing that people would say is synonymous with the dark web, if you were to ask them, would be cybercrime. And that's gonna include, of course, you know, they're probably familiar with, with the online drug markets um, and uh, other things like that. Uh, but they're also, no doubt, most people would say that the dark web is likely associated with contraband pornography, particularly child pornography. Um, but uh, they would also likely say that you can also get other contraband pornography there as well if you were to ask them. So things like snuff films. If you're not familiar with a snuff film, what we're talking about here is a pornographic video that features uh, the death of a subject. People associate that with the dark web, and so it gives rise to certain certain urban legends, and the Red Room is one of those. A, so a Red Room, as the urban legend goes, is a place where individuals can log in on the dark web and they can either uh, contribute money uh, to commission certain snuff acts or torture acts, uh, what they call hurt core porn, or in this case, uh, enter a Red Room and see somebody and vote on whether or not they survive. I, I say it's an urban legend only because there haven't been, to my knowledge, any real-world events that would corroborate any of the details in the myth of a Red Room. Um, 
I also say that it's a myth because um, anybody who's been on the dark web would, would likely agree with this, but uh, I can tell you the technology, the underlying technology of the anonymizing technology that you need to access these onion sites simply does not make streaming video a practical option. It just doesn't. Um, it's 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 more secure, at least it's ostensibly more secure, but it is very slow. The dark web, if you've never seen any onion sites, is very much like what the internet was like in the 90s or the early 2000s before there was broadband internet access more or less in all you municipalities. Um, there's not a lot of multimedia uh, that you're going to find on there because it just takes up bandwidth that isn't required. So it's mostly text-based. There are there are some images, um, but they generally are slow loading. Uh, they tend to be very unreliable. So it's just simply not a good way to host a live streaming event, at least as of 2021. I'm not saying that it couldn't be done. It certainly could. What I'm getting at is that although Red Rooms are... To my knowledge, again, um, nothing more than an urban legend. There are horrible things that you can see on the dark web, but these horrible things are far more likely to be found on the clear net, which we'll talk about the difference between the clear net and the dark web in just a moment. But for example, um, Peter Scully uh, is a uh, was well, currently convicted felon uh, serving time in Australia who was living in the Philippines, who produced a number of hurtcore videos featuring children. So they were also child pornography. Uh, and he sold these clips for as much as $10,000 a piece. And these were not hosted on the dark web. They were hosted on the clear web. There are also other cases, human trafficking cases, where people were put up for sale over Craigslist. And there was just simply... Um, in order to obfuscate the, the nature of the commodity being traded, um, they would simply use an analog, like, for example, make it, they would say they're selling furniture, they're selling a wardrobe, but they'd say this is the Christie wardrobe or something like that, um, and what you were really buying was a person named Christie. This was on the clear web. This is on Craigslist. So the dark web absolutely does have illegal activity that, that is conducted there, um, but considering the technologies of the Internet, the majority of cybercrime, far and away the majority of cybercrime, uh, is actually done right out in the open on sites that are publicly accessible to every person without the use of any special anonymizing technology. So that seems to be the premise of the show, and it looks like, uh, according to what we're seeing here, the votes for death are far outweighing those for life for this girl. And looking at the uh, chat that's scrolling by, we can see we have, uh, seems to be an anonymized user base. Everyone's just giving the appellation of user and then probably some kind of ordinal numbering system. Although, the simple act of numbering users in a system like this, in some respects, does de-anonymize them. Uh, numbers that are applied to the end of them, there's going to be some kind of a seed that's described. Anonymizing technology, uh, like, for example, anonymous uh, chatting services, uh, will actually just ascribe a completely random appellation to every user. So uh, those are usually words that are picked randomly out of a dictionary, which means that they are distinctive enough that they can be identified in a chat, uh, but they are also not something uh, that is associated in any way with the user. And if the system is done right, there's no record of who that person is in the system either. All right, so Adam is back uh, again with some more dialogue here, and it is unfortunately very disappointing to me. It really seems like uh, our protagonist should not be trusting Adam. He obviously has no idea what he's talking about. And, uh, so Adam says that getting on the shadow web is a task on its own. Uh, so first of all, the shadow web isn't a common term in any of the parlance that I'm familiar with. It seems that what Adam is referring to is the dark web. So we could we could say sure that the shadow web is an acceptable uh, maybe it, it's the in-game uh, analog to the dark web for some reason. Uh, the shadow web, however, he says, is a whole other level of the deep web. Um, and uh, no, no, it's it's not uh, unfortunately. Um, so I'm actually going to pull up a graphic here so I can show you what I'm talking about because it's time to talk about the distinction between the clear web the deep web and the dark web. So 
Um, there are search engines out there that uh, if you don't remember the internet prior to search engines, you know that if you wanted to find anything, you either made use of whatever rudimentary search engines were available, or prior to that, you made use of link rings. So essentially you would visit a site and that site would have a links page and it would lead you to other pages that are either affiliated with or endorsed by the owner of the site which you are on. It was a terrible way to navigate the infinite reality of the internet. Uh, and and so search engines were another major revolution in internet technology. Um, what search engines do these days is they index sites. So search engines will crawl around the internet uh, with bots and they will look for important pieces of information. They will index them, which means that they essentially categorize them in their systems so that when you search for for example, uh, dog walkers in your city, uh, it can easily pull back using those search terms and searching through their, re referencing it through their index and seeing uh, sites that match, uh, for example, 80% um, dog walker and your city name. And those results come back. Anything that you can find via a search engine is known as the clear web. The clear web for 99% of people out there that use the internet is the internet. That's going to be your popular sites, Facebook, Reddit, TikTok, um, whatever else. If you can put it into a search engine and it comes up, that's an indexed site and it's on the clear net. The deep web is not a term at all that is associated with anything nefarious or cybercrime related. The deep web is simply a term for all of the sites that you don't get when you search through a search engine or which you can't reach directly. People interface with the deep web all the time. Because the deep web includes systems like, for example, your online banking system. If you search into a search engine, if you put your bank account number in there, you are not or you definitely should not get a search result leading to your bank account. That's because banking information is in databases that are meant to be secured. They aren't accessible directly through the internet. You need to have credentials in order to access those systems. The virtue alone of having some kind of access control before you access that data means it's part of the deep web. The deep web therefore also includes other such places. Like for example, if you're a student, uh, your information is on many computer systems at that university. There's a student information system, for example, that you you will log into to register for classes. You can't access that directly from a search engine. You can't access that directly by entering the URL. You're going to need to enter in your credentials and possibly some kind of multi-factor authentication token in order to access any of that information. That student information system is part of the deep web. So this is not at all at, in any way affiliated with anything nefarious. This is just a, simply a term that means that there are sites out there that are being hosted that aren't accessible either from the public internet or through a search engine. They're not available on the clear net. That's simply all it means. The majority of the internet, yes, is in the deep web. Um, very few, relatively speaking, sites are indexed by search engines because, uh, simply put, not all interior sites to most pages are really worth indexing on their own. Um, and so often what is uh, what is used in these cases as a, a metaphor is the iceberg. So the iceberg, uh, of course, you see an, a certain amount of the iceberg that's peaking above the water. In terms of our analogy, uh, the amount of internet you see peaking above the water is the clear net, right? So those are your popular websites that most people visit, and that's the internet to them. Everything below that, below the surface of the water, is the majority of the iceberg. Just like the majority of the internet is the deep web, because that's going to include everything that's not indexed by a search engine. All of the email systems, for example, like that are out there, they're not directly accessible from the internet. Banking information and all the other examples I just gave you. Now, what is the difference between the deep web and the dark web? Well, as I said before, there's one definition of the dark web, which could be uh, that it is essentially sites available on the internet that can only be accessed with the use of certain anonymizing technologies. The dark web doesn't necessarily mean that the sites are criminal in nature. Not at all. 
there are plenty of sites that are on the dark web. Uh, the one example I gave before was sites that allow whistleblowers to connect with journalists. WikiLeaks has a dark website, for example. Um, there are other sites on the internet, on the dark web, that also have nothing to do with anything illegal whatsoever at all. It's simply places where knowledge is freely shared. Uh, and legally, mind you. So, uh, in that respect, the dark web isn't what people generally think it is. It's simply sites that require some kind of anonymizing technology or a specific kind of anonymizing technology to access. However, although I've given you that, that definition, I don't think it's 100% accurate because although it is true, it is not what people associate with the dark web. And to be honest with you, the term dark web uh, is not a very good appellation for that. But still, in this case, that would be the distinction between the dark web and the deep web. Now, the term dark web, the connotation that it has with most people, would instead have a definition of sites that deal with illegal activity, right? Um, and if that's the definition that we use, then there are plenty of dark websites that are available on the public internet. There are even dark websites that are indexed by search engines. That means that the dark web in our chart here would actually extend from the clear net all the way down to the very bottom because the dark websites would exist at every level no matter where you are on the internet. Some of them are only accessible um, behind user uh, username password credential pairs. Some of them are uh, behind um, you know one-time passwords. Uh, some of them are available uh, on the clear web and such. Uh, because if we were to say that a dark website, if we define it as any site that deals with anything illegal, well, then we're talking about including uh, torrent sites. Uh, we're talking about uh, Reddit, uh, uh, subreddits that deal with questionably legal material, which uh, you know generally Reddit will ban them, but until they do, uh, those sorry, those sites are indexed by search engines, uh, and they post illegal information. But that would also include your dark websites uh, that are available only through anonymizing technology, like for example, Silk Road way back in the day, um, or, Al or Alpha Bay or whatever. All of those would be included as well. So uh, Adam's terminology here of the shadow web, the deep web, he's he's uh, he's conflating terms, uh, and. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that if this were the real world, it would be clear that he would not know what he is talking about in this respect. But maybe in the game world, the deep web and the dark web are synonymous, and then he's talking about a whole different level, the shadow web. What he's implying here is if we were to use the correct terminology here and replace deep web with dark web, he would be saying that the shadow web is a whole other level of the dark web. So basically what he would be saying is, is that there is a darker web. And that doesn't seem like it makes sense either. She mentioned the prey, he says, which is interesting because they mostly operating... Hold on. She mentioned the prey, which is interesting because they mostly... Okay, I didn't read it wrong. That is what it says. They mostly operating on the normal deep web. I have a feeling that she might have stumbled across something more sinister and they are using the prey as a front. All right, it seems like we're dealing with a fairly convoluted plot here, but that's okay. Let's keep going. So I'm noticing the chat scrolling by here on the left-hand side. Uh, we have a mix of users that are voting death, that are um, essentially enacting some kind of misogynistic fantasy or something like that. I would say that that's fairly accurate for what you would get here. Um, you're also seeing quite a few people here are thinking that it's fake. That's also quite accurate. Um, I'd say that uh, any any given stream that you go to not even necessarily like this, but featuring virtually any content uh, will have its fair number of people that are clearly very angry and uh, some people that are just terminally incredulous. I've got a couple of people here uh, that are, are worried about her that want to come and save her, and uh, I, I think that that may be slightly less accurate. Um, generally speaking, in terms of the sociological functioning of things like chat rooms like this, uh, the way that we communicate and organize in anonymous ways like this over the internet, it's different than real life. And you may get once in a while somebody like that, but generally speaking, people who, who would speak up against the group like this are generally shouted down pretty fast. They get accused of white knighting or, um, you know, saying that they don't belong or if you don't like it, turn it off or it's fake anyway, that kind of a thing. Um, so not that people like this don't exist, but they tend to be pretty rare. Generally speaking, if somebody has a conscience on the internet and decides to do something about this, they won't bother trying to convince the rest of chat to do it because they're simply not going to listen. Instead, they'll, they'll do other things, uh, perhaps like reporting the site to authorities.
So it looks like this uh, woman here is a reporter like us named Amelia, who's been kidnapped and is now um, on this Red Room site. Uh, she keeps mentioning men in masks, which reminds me of a document I read a while back. They're more of a cult. No one knows their official name online, but we refer to them as Noir. Okay. All right, now we're seeing the premise of the game here is apparently to reassemble the URL to a an anonymous site. In this case, it would be an onion site, but in this case, an ANN site. Um, we need to reassemble eight parts of that URL in order to access the site. Although what that will do exactly, I don't know. Um, having the URL alone certainly isn't going to help you to put a stop to this and uh, isn't likely to help you as a journalist um, with locating even where the site is being hosted. Looks like Adam has provided us with some dossiers here uh, on some of the things that Amelia came across that may be an issue for our protagonist as well. The first one says police. Looks like if we open it up here, we have an intercept cable law enforcement television bolo. So in law enforcement speak, bolo is short for be on the lookout. Um, Law Enforcement Cyber Division. It doesn't say what agency this is supposed to be. It simply says Law Enforcement Cyber Division. So apparently in the context of the game world, there is only one law enforcement organization that handles everything. Uh, and within that organization, there is a cyber division. In cases like this, uh, generally speaking, most local law enforcement agencies, your, your municipal law enforcement agencies, uh, depending on, of course, your municipality, probably doesn't have resources to go after a lot of cybercrime. It's actually kind of a huge problem in law enforcement right now. There's not enough individuals uh, to affect the investigation of crimes that occur online um, and not enough forensic experts to deal with digital evidence, which is very unfortunate. It's kind of a serious problem. So uh, generally speaking, since most municipalities are kind of in that boat, generally what we would be looking at here is some kind of a regional law enforcement organization or in the United States, uh, more likely the Federal Bureau of Investigations, which is responsible for interstate crimes and most cyber crimes, not all, but most cyber crimes and most computer crimes um, are going to fall within the, uh, the definition of, of, uh, of interstate crimes. Uh, what we have here is attention, Precinct 64 Tactical. So apparently the Cyber Crimes Unit has a uh, an interior tactical unit. So a tactical unit is going to be a series of police officers that are dedicated uh, to the uh, to tactical training and gear. So we're talking about SWAT teams here. Uh, SWAT stands for is, a, is an acronym. SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. The note says pockets for legal activity have begun to appear over our monitored deep web nodes. Uh, that's fairly true to life. Uh, one of the problems with having node technology, anonymizing technology, is that if a node is seized, it operates kind of like a man in the middle attack by law enforcement. So all of the web requests that travel through that node, there is a, a an opportunity for police potentially uh, to uh, to divine the source of uh, of that traffic. Be on the lookout for increased traffic in your networks. In accordance with the department's new cybercrime initiative, warrants for forced entry will be given expedited approval. Um, so that is a that is a problem. Uh, it seems the developers aren't really entirely familiar with the legal process here or the process of a, of affecting searches. So here in the United States, uh, we have a Fourth Amendment implied right to privacy. So all people shall be secure in their papers and effects and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause. So what he's said here is very specifically that it's going to be a warrant. Uh, warrants must be issued on probable cause. Now, if the police are monitoring network traffic and they do see traffic of an illicit nature coming from a node uh, that does give them probable cause for a search, but it does not necessarily give them probable cause for what he's calling a forced entry warrant. There's no such thing as a forced entry warrant. So the way it usually works is if police have probable cause to believe that a certain place or a certain person has evidence of a serious crime, what they need to do is they need to go to an officer of the court. The police do not issue their own warrants. A judge must approve 
a warrant for them. It must be signed by a judge, and the police must make their case to that officer of the court, to that judge. The warrant must include, with specificity, what is to be seized and where it is to be searched. If not, then it won't be issued. So the police must go to this judge and they must say, this is what we believe they are holding. This is where we believe we are. they are holding it. The judge will then sign that warrant and then law enforcement can go and serve that warrant, which means that the person who owns that property must be given notice in the form of that warrant. So the police will show up with the warrant. They will say, I have a warrant to search this location. Here it is. The individual is given an opportunity to look at the warrant and then they must comply with that court order or there will be serious repercussions. Now there is in certain jurisdictions what's known as a no-knock warrant. And those are warrants that are issued still by a judge and still only with probable cause. But essentially it means that the warrant need not be served before the search is conducted. Instead, the police can basically break in, they can do their search and notify you either during or after the search that they have a warrant and what they're there for. Now those are very controversial and for good reason. Um, but in any event, they still are only issued uh, by probable cause and they still must be very specific in what is to be searched and, um, and uh, sorry, what they're searching for and where they, it may, might be found. So and when it comes to these no-knock warrants, they do still need to be issued with probable cause. They must still have some kind of specificity to them but they, they are, at least at, at the time of this recording, um, a potential, and that's potentially what he's talking about here. Warrants for forced entry will be given expedited approval. Uh, CCU will be filtering deep web activity based on heat map data of illegal sites visited and attempts of felonious activity. Uh, this is, again, this is more bull. Uh, I'm sorry, I really don't want to, have to call it that, uh, but uh, within the context of the game world, maybe this is true, but this has no uh, no analog to the real world. It is true that law enforcement has seized illegal sites in the past, and rather than taking the sites down immediately, continued to operate the site for a number of days or weeks afterwards in an attempt to collect information of people who are visiting that site. That has happened. Um, but the police do not have the ability to simply monitor illegal sites that they don't control. That's not something that can happen. They may control a node, uh, and they may control. They may be logging information that passes through that node, but they can't monitor illegal sites. And law enforcement continuing to operate those illegal sites uh, to collect this information is another source of great controversy at the time of this recording, because technically what police are doing is they are distributing illegal material, right? So it's not something that's always done, and it is a controversial move. But really, that's the only way that they could collect that information. Now, further investigation will be conducted on the proposed suspects and a warrant issued if found necessary. Investigations also concluded that individuals who constantly switch networks are not traceable. Well, I mean, that is somewhat true. Uh, it is possible to be tracked across different uh, networks. So um, when you connect to a network, um, DHCP, will, which is a technology, will generally issue you an IP address on that network. So. If you're connected to your router at home, you might be given a private IP address like 192.168.0 something. But if you disconnect from your home network and take your laptop to Starbucks and connect to their Wi-Fi, you'll be given a different IP address. It's not going to be the same one across all networks because maybe, um, you know, maybe you'll get, a, a, let's say you're still in a private IP range, maybe you'll be at 192.168.0 and then something else. But there is uh, certain things about your connection that will be the same on both of those networks or any network that you connect to, uh, like for example, the MAC address, right? The machine address that is associated with your networking device. Now it is possible um, to, to change that with certain software and on certain devices, those uh, particularly by Apple, their mobile devices, uh, MAC scrambling is, is an onboard native uh, uh, technology, something that you can take advantage of. But speaking generally, um, you know, unless you take steps to do so, your your Mac will remain consistent throughout. Um, that said, the majority of the time when individuals' uh, activity is linked across multiple networks, there are other reliable indicators as well, things that are uh, a little bit more difficult to hide. Um, so what we're talking about here is we're talking about correlated usage patterns, right? So if you are connected at home and you tend to visit Reddit and Facebook 
and you also tend to visit a certain dark website at a certain time. Well, if something happens and you get a new internet service provider or uh, you know you connect to a new network, you're still the same person and you're probably still gonna be doing the same things generally on both of those networks because you're using the internet to do certain things, right? And the internet is a tool and how you use that tool, it depends entirely on you and what you're up to. Um, so correlated usage patterns essentially mean that no matter what network you're on, you're gonna be doing roughly the same things. There are certain certain things rather that you'll be, be doing regularly. Also, don't forget that regardless of the network that you're on, you're still going to be, for example, sending the same username passwords to the same sites because that's your account um, and so on. And all of this means that it's it's actually not that difficult to connect activity across multiple networks, uh, despite what this uh, game apparently is, is having us believe. Uh, finally, use of force and disorienting devices permitted. So... Um, Use of force. So, okay, <laughs> there's just kind of a lot actually to unpack with this one simple sentence here. Um, the authorization of force is not something that can simply be granted. Um, police cannot simply say use of force is permitted. Um, force must be. Police are only allowed to cer use a certain amount of force uh, that meets the amount of force that they are presented with. So, the police can't simply come in. Uh, if you put your hands up and you surrender, they can't immediately begin treating you as if you're attacking them uh, and start beating you. Now, I, of course, this obviously is also very controversial because there's plenty of evidence that shows that police do use excessive force, probably on a regular basis. But um, the way it's supposed to work uh, is the police can't simply say use of force is authorized. They, they, they simply can't go in and use uh, any amount of force that they wish. Uh, if you surrender, they are supposed to arrest you, and if you fight back, then they are allowed to treat you as if you're resisting arrest and then use an amount of force necessary uh, to complete the arrest. So disorienting device, or, or what he means here, I assume, is the use of non-lethal devices that police will use to, to uh, force um, acquiescence out of a, uh, a subject. So disorienting devices here, we could be talking about tasers, could be talking about flashbang grenades because this is a tactical unit. Uh, could be talking about um, pepper spray uh, or gas, uh, something like that. All of those would be less than lethal devices that I guess in one way or another could be considered disorienting. Although the term disorienting devices is not really one that's typically used. So giving them the benefit of the doubt. So our uh, next danger here is labeled Lucas, source government intel cross communications bucket classified by DAS, okay, secret. Name Lucas Kamiga, age 34, country of origin Poland. Lucas Kamiga served six years in the Polish land forces before recruitment into the GW Grom where he further served an additional seven years. Lucas then made a transition to the AN before his disappearance. Slater found that Kumiga had been receiving payment for Polish government secrets involving operations with the US via cryptocurrency through transfer services on the deep web. An investigation had been opened, and it was soon learned that Lucas had been responsible for illegal torture and other violent war crimes. Kumiga was terminated from the AW and charged with treason. Upon being charged, Kamiga fled Poland and is believed to be providing contract killing services through his deep web contacts. Intelligence has yet to provide the location of Lucas Kamiga, although field agents have been attempting to connect reports of seemingly random homicides involving forced entry with fatal gunshot wounds to the head, fatal gunshot wounds to the head shot through the victim's front door. A very small number of reports believed by the CIA to be the same killer have surfaced from individuals who have managed to hide while the attacker entered their homes, describing a bald man in a suit. While the CIA has reasons to believe this man is Lucas Kamiga, the reports are from locations all over the world and have yet to be connected to one place of origin. All right, so this is kind of an interesting danger. It looks like what we have here uh, is a contract killer, a bald suited contract killer, which reminds me a lot of Agent 47 from the Hitman series of games, which are from Eidos, or is it Ubisoft? Or was it Eidos and now it's Ubisoft? Uh, looks like Eidos Interactive, then Square Enix, then Warner Brothers Interactive, and now IO Interactive. Okay, well, that's good to know. 
Um, yeah, so it reminds me of Agent 47. But uh, what we're really talking about here are contract killers through the deep web, it says here. So I, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, to be the one to have to tell you this if you're interested in hiring a hitman over the dark web. Uh, but 99% of hitmen available on the dark web are federal agents. Uh, hiring hitmen over the dark web is simply not a thing that happens. Why would you? Why, if you were a contract killer, why would you make it that difficult to find you? Why would you go on the deep web when you don't have to? The majority of contract killers are contracted by somebody who knows them in person or through somebody who knows them. Uh, for example, your cousin did time with somebody who's willing to kill somebody for money, that kind of a thing. Um, there have been examples of contract killers being hired through the internet, for example, uh, Craigslist, but that's the clear web, not necessarily the dark web, at least as, as we're defining it here in this game. I would consider it the dark web because it's an illegal service being done over the internet, but most people wouldn't think so. So, um, yes, uh, the, the whole contract killers over the dark web thing is, uh, is a myth unless you consider the dark web to be any illegal activity that's conducted over the internet and uh and i have i have problems with both definitions honestly um i think that the dark web doesn't necessarily apply to what it ought to and the term dark web shouldn't apply to what it does i guess is what i'm saying all right the next one all right so uh source alternative media cache government data collection oddly enough I believe that this was supposed to take place in 2016, and it says 2017 there, so is is this supposed to, in the game, be from the future, or am I just wrong on when it takes place? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It says, it doesn't matter who I tell anymore or what I say, no one believes me, and I know they will find this and delete it. The government will deny the noir exists to keep simple minds at ease, but I know the truth. I just hope one illuminated mind sees this before it's too late. I know they are going to kill me. I've read about how they do it, and it's happening to me now. They're phantoms appearing in the corner of your eye, only to vanish into darkness, letting you know that you've been chosen. If you find yourself looking over your shoulder, do not linger in the dark. They will find you. If you approach a man in a ghostly mask, run and hide. If you don't, you are in their trap, and you are already dead. I heard if you turn away from them and show your back, count from the 30, they disappear. I hope I'm right. Okay. Um, I can't think of any analog uh, with the real world on this one. Uh, the noir, I think, previously were described as a kind of cult or something like that. Um, I can see the noir tunnel on the desktop. Looks like the masks from the people at the beginning of the game. Um, so I'm guessing that's who they are. Um, which isn't to say that there aren't, uh, um, you know, cults active on the internet or specifically on the dark web. Um, there are. I've just never heard of anything like this before. It sounds to me like this might be uh, something more like uh, The uh, Strangers, the movie. Um, so yeah, I can't think of an analog in, uh, in the real world. It sounds kind of like it might be uh, like the antagonists from the movie uh, The Strangers, which I think might be a film series. Well, in any event, that's what it sounds like more than anything else, which, if I remember correctly, I'm kind of a horror buff. Uh, so if I remember correctly, with that movie, it wasn't based on any real-world crime, at least not that I'm aware of. I believe that The Strangers was based on um, the experiences of the writer as a child, if I remember correctly. Um, I could be wrong about that, but in any event, uh, yeah, no no real-world analog that I can I can think of. Next, we have Breather, source, public record, police blotter. December 3rd, 2017. So again, we have uh, some weird issue with the dates here. I don't know. I don't know when this is taking place anymore. Anyway, police responded to a call reporting a man wearing a hoodie and what appeared to be a surgical mask entering an alleyway followed by pounding sounds and screams, as described by the caller. Investigators found the body of 27-year-old Charles Roberts dead inside a building attached to the alley. The case detective reports Roberts tried to escape by hiding in the building's back entryway, but damage to the door and clear signs of a struggle inside the building suggests the attacker managed to kick the door in and overtake Roberts. The coroner report reveals that the victim suffered 13 stab wounds to the abdomen and neck. Um, so this is vague enough that it could be an analog to any number of real world scenarios. Of course, people. Um, are killed all the time, particularly in the city and in alleyways, as this describes. 
um, which isn't to say I, I don't want to say all the time as if it's a daily occurrence or anything like that, but it would be difficult to find any one particular um, uh, event to point to in this case. I can tell you what it does remind me of, um, which perhaps for no particular reason, um, but for some reason it, it does call to mind the murder of Kitty Genovese. Uh, which is a pretty infamous case from the 60s in New York. Um, and it's infamous, although, uh, as it turns out, perhaps it shouldn't be. So this is the case uh, where Kitty Genovese uh, was uh, in her home, her apartment, um, and was in the entryway to her building when somebody entered and assaulted her and ended up stabbing her a number of times. The attack went over the course of a number of minutes the entire time, Kitty was screaming and asking for help, but nobody came to her aid. Um, and it sort of became uh, an infamous case among New Yorkers that signified the callousness uh, and disregard that New Yorkers had for their neighbors. You know, they were, you know, minding their own business to a fault, I guess, in this case. Now, as it happens, um, and by the way, I don't want to be disrespectful. Kitty Genovese is how I know the case. Uh, that's not her real name. That was her nickname. So uh, just to be sure... Uh, that I'm being respectful here. Her name was Catherine, Catherine Susan Genovese. I just want to be clear about that. Um, I, anyway, so uh, yeah, it became infamous for that. But uh, in investigating that case, doing a little bit of research on it, it turns out that it may be, um, it may be a little bit of, uh, of a stretch. Uh, it may not be as bad as it seems when you first hear the story. The, eventually, the murderer of Kitty Genovese, uh, Winston Mosley, was eventually captured by police in an unrelated house burglary and confessed to the murder. Um, but it turns out that her neighbors did hear her pleas and uh, even um, uh, had contacted authorities for assistance. It's just that uh, it just didn't happen, uh, you know, in time to save her. And so... Um, this, uh, this gave rise to a phenomenon known as the bystander effect. It was assumed that everybody just kind of assumed that somebody else would be helping and that they didn't have to get involved at all. Uh, it looks like the rest of these are not specific threats. They appear to be, um, hacking and minigames. So the first one we have is Zone Wall. Zone wall is an integrated firewall suite apart from the AD operations system. Okay, so that is the, uh, the OS that we're dealing with here is known as AD. Um, however, it does say the AD operation system, which is not the correct nomenclature here. It's an operating system, not an operation system. Um, and it's an integrated firewall suite. So what we're looking at here is a host-based firewall that is native to the operating system. Its purpose is to serve as the first line of defense against incoming attacks. Written first in the year 2004 by developer Proxy Zero, it has been a staple of the ADOS security suits. That must be a misspelling. When presented with the Zone Wall tool upon a successful solve, it will insta block the incoming attack. Failure, you will have to defeat the incoming hack with one of the following tools. Okay. Um, so this is a hacking minigame, so I'm not going to be too harsh on this, um, to be honest with you. It's a game mechanic, and again, when we look at these things, we, we have to consider them within the context of the game world, right? It is, there are certain real-world components, and there are certain components that must exist in order for the game to be enjoyable. Um, you know, it doesn't have to make sense, and to be honest with you, uh, in the real world, uh, hacking or being hacked is a lot, it's not a very exciting it's a thing, you know, it's not interactive. Um, you know, like in this case, if uh, if we were being attacked on this system uh, and we wanted to use the firewall to prevent that attack, it would simply be uh, bringing up the rule set for the firewall and creating a new rule for the IP, IP block or port or whatever we needed to, to do to protect ourselves in this case. And that's really not very exciting. So I'm not gonna blame them for, for not, uh, not doing this. Um, I don't take exception to their characterizing the firewall as the first line of defense. I think it's a bit of a stretch, but it certainly could be the case. Um, and uh, yeah, it, there's there's a couple of things in here that, that kind of caused me to raise my eyebrow, like the use of the term operation system instead of operating system. 
the fact that it was first written in the year 2004 by developer Proxy Zero. Um, I don't know if I would use a firewall developed by somebody <laughs> named Proxy Zero. Um, and I certainly wouldn't use one that, uh, that referred to itself as a security suit instead of a security suite, but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to nitpick here. All right. Our next hacking analog here is mem defragger, elite speak defragger, uh, mem defragger, which first started off as an open source project with, uh, within, this should be one word, not within, within. The Black Hat community, now a security tool used by professionals worldwide. The tool is responsible for blocking incoming memory corrupting attacks. Okay. So, uh, first of all, where do I even begin? Memory defragmentation is something uh, that you do to a disk to increase operational efficiency. So when memory is allocated uh, on a disk or even in volatile memory, it's not necessarily allocated contiguously. So by that, what I mean is think of memory and let's for the sake of simplicity, let's talk about your hard disk in your computer. Your hard disk on your computer has uh, a finite amount of space. Let's say that it's a one terabyte drive. That one terabyte is not one big segment. It is actually one terabyte of smaller segments. The smallest segment that can be reserved on a disk is a sector, and that sector is typically uh, 512 bytes. So let's say that you have a file that is more than 512 bytes. Well, that means that it must reserve more than one sector to fit and save on the disk. So let's say that you have a file that spans three and a half sectors. The computer cannot reserve a section of memory that is smaller than a byte, and so it must reserve four sectors to save that data. Now those four sectors aren't necessarily reserved contiguously, right? It's not necessarily sector one, two, three, and four are all reserved together because something may already reside in, for example, sector three. So perhaps that file resides in sector one, two, four, and five or six. That means that when the system needs to recall that data, for example, when you open the file, it's going to go to sector one because that's the start of the file. And then it's going to go through each sector in order to grab all of the rest of the data for the file until it reaches the last sector, which will contain an end of file marker. Now, because they're not all reserved contiguously, that's not very efficient, um, especially on the old style platter drives where there's actually a head that is floating between platters reading the disk. The head must physically move between these locations in order to read that data. Um, so it is much more efficient to have them all as close together as possible. That is defragmentation. So essentially what you're doing there is you're taking all of those fragments and rather than, than leaving them in random places on the disk, you are moving them to the newly un unallocated space. So something has been deleted or moved, temporary files that were no longer required are cleaned out, and etc. So now there is room that is unallocated closer to the start of the file. That's what defragmentation is. It brings all of those together. And again, this could be any type of memory, really. However, with volatile memory, generally speaking, there are different types of volatile memory. There's the stack and the heap. The stack tends to be more orderly than the heap, as the name implies. And uh, in the case of that, it's generally not something that you need to worry about defragmenting because it's volatile memory and it is by its very nature transient and temporary. So um, this whole premise here is already kind of suspect with memory defragger being some hacker tool or something like that, uh, I guarantee uh, memory defragmentation is just something that operating systems, modern operating systems anyway, do as a matter of course. It was something in older operating systems that was optional, uh, but these days it's usually just kind of part and parcel with the maintenance that is automatically done with modern operating systems, particularly the Windows operating system. Um, so it first started off as an open source project within the Black Hat community. Uh, Black Hat is a term that essentially ascribes a certain 
Um, it, it, okay, so there are three types of, of hackers in this model we're discussing right now. Black hat, white hat, and gray hat. Black hats are the bad guys, just like in Westerns, right? They are the hackers that do illegal things and exploit vulnerabilities for their own personal gain. White hat hackers uh, are those that stay within the bounds of professional ethics and legality. And Grey Hat are somewhere kind of in the middle where they may do things that aren't necessarily above board in terms of maintaining the ethics um, of, of uh, professional hacking, uh, but maybe not necessarily always technically within the bounds of legality or vice versa. They tend to adhere to legality, but not necessarily ethos. So... Uh, what they're implying here by saying that this is a, an open source project within the Black Hat community is essentially that this started off as some kind of a tool uh, that would be done in illegal hacking or something like that, uh, but is now a used by a uh, security tool used by professionals worldwide. I mean, I guess this characterization could be true for this fictional uh, fictional uh, tool, um, but uh, honestly, there's very little difference between Black Hat, White Hat, and Gray Hat hackers. It all has to come down to professionalism, but they use the same tools, they use the same techniques. Um, you know, there's there's nothing that's kind of out of bounds for, for uh, offensive security, right? If it works, it works. Um, the tool is responsible for blocking incoming memory corrupting attacks. I'm not even going to attempt to explain that because that doesn't make any sense. Um, there are a lot of operating system exploits that will deal with what could be considered corrupting memory. Uh, but this is not, uh, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm not even, I'm not even going to attempt to, uh, figure out what that could mean in the real world. Uh, next we have a stack pusher, a recent new addition to the AD operating system. Oh, well that time they got the nomenclature correct operating system. Uh, it is a security tool to prevent stack overflow attacks. Developed by computer science major Tyler Draven in 2015, it has rose to the top as one of the leading security tools. That is kind of an awkward last sentence there, but... Um, so it says that it is a tool that is used to prevent stack overflow attacks. So as I just described a little while ago, volatile memory comes in several different flavors. Uh, there's the stack and the heap. The stack tends to be the order more orderly than the heap. The stack is where you're going to find memory that is reserved at application runtime. Whereas the heap is going to be reserved for uh, items that must be dynamically allocated. So a stack overflow um, could be, for example, a buffer overflow attack or, or something along those lines where a certain amount of space has been reserved for a certain type of data. And that if you are able to write an excessive amount of data to that, so in excess of what has been reserved for it, then you will overflow uh, for example, that buffer, and it can it can be used to to do some kind of exploits. But um, in this case, um, obviously, this is just a mini game. Uh, so what you're seeing here doesn't really have anything to do with uh, with what that would really look like in the real world. Okay, next we have Node Hacker. Not much is known about this security tool except its introduction to the AD operating system in 2014. It is used to correct compromised networking nodes through the anonymous node network. Um, okay. Um, so it is not possible or should not be possible for a client to reconfigure a server in this system. Now, I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible. I mean, obviously, you know, from a client with shell access, you can configure uh, servers connected to a network, uh, but in the onion routing or in the anonymous node network in this case, uh, no client should be able to do that. And certainly doing so anonymously would be rather difficult because you would need to have access, shell access to that machine or obtain shell access to that machine, I suppose, in order to make any configuration changes. Um, I don't know what it means uh, when it says, quote, to correct compromising, compromised network nodes. Uh, I don't know if that means that you are supposed to be, for example, adding firewall rules or something to one of these network nodes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of any. I can't think of anything this might actually relate to, um, other than simply, other than simply configuring um, these nodes yourself, uh, which you definitely would not want to do in this case. That would be a, a very bad idea. 
All right, Adam is back with us again. Uh, now he's talking about DOS coin, a cryptocurrency used on the deep web. You will need DOS coin to purchase upgrades and items to help you on your way. Okay, DOS coin is apparently some kind of analog for a cryptocurrency in the real world like Bitcoin or Ethereum or there's uh, various different varieties. Uh, Bitcoin is the uh, Bitcoin is uh, at least at the time of this recording the the most popular. Uh, getting into cryptocurrencies would would take me quite a while to to fully explain, so I won't. But suffice to say that yes, cryptocurrency is a real thing. Uh, it is really used for transactions in the dark web. Um, drug marketplaces, for example, will accept payment in cryptocurrencies. And at the time of this recording, uh, cryptocurrencies are gaining traction as a legitimate, viable alternative currency in other places outside of illegal transactions. Um, but uh, it's still pretty volatile, and its longevity, in my opinion, is somewhat in question. Although, um, considering the value of Bitcoin these days, I do wish I had held on to my Bitcoin from back in 2008. That would have been very nice. Okay, now what the hell even is this? So, apparent. Okay, so the purpose within the context of the game, the purpose of DOS coin is that you can purchase items that will help you in your investigation into the dark web. Okay, that's. That's fine. Uh, In-game currency and stuff, that's just fine. Uh, however, Adam then says uh, that you can use these DOS coin to, for example, purchase, purchase a remote VPN, which he says is a device that generates DOS coin during a certain period of time. Hackers will rent these devices from you to do their deeds. Depending on the location you place it at will determine the amount of DOS coin you generate. Be sure to place it at a good location in your apartment complex to see what it generates. What the fuck? The what? So no, no. A, a VPN is a virtual private network. It is anonymizing technology. It's meant, essentially, to create a secure tunnel from your machine as the client to the VPN server so that all web requests are made on your behalf by the VPN server. Their origin is obfuscated, so in order to detect where a web request originated from, if, for example, you were police uh, who had one of these compromised nodes, they would see the request coming from the VPN server, but would not be able to see that it's coming from your computer, not unless they went to the VPN server and the VPN server contained logs of those web requests, and then they would be able to connect your machine with that web request. It's anonymizing, it's virtual private network, and it's a good thing to have, generally speaking. A remote VPN would be a VPN server that is hosted somewhere out on the public internet, which you need to make a web request to and pass credentials to in order to um, utilize the VPN service, as opposed uh, to having a either local VPN server or even a host-based VPN uh, that would be run through some kind of local proxy or something like that, both of which are less desirable, obviously. What it definitely is not is some kind of device that you place in an apartment complex that allows hackers to do their deeds. Even within the context of the game, this doesn't make any sense. You're a journalist, and this guy Adam wants you to essentially stand up VPN servers in your apartment building so that cyber criminals can conduct illegal activity, this doesn't make any sense. Why would, I think maybe Adam is actually the bad guy in this whole, maybe he's secretly behind all of this and we're trusting him for some stupid reason, but if that were the case, uh, this would be the point where I would, dev I mean, I already know he doesn't know what he's talking about, but this would be the point at which I know that he's the one behind all of this and he's trying to get me arrested or something like that. This doesn't make any sense. That's, no, this is, no. No, this is this is just using terminology incorrectly, but it's just using it because it's oh, no, I'm done. I'm done. That concludes the analysis of Welcome to the Game 2. Uh, don't play it. Uh, I hope you learned something. Bye.